right. Thank you, Steve. Good evening, man. All right, you guys uh, see the announcements, and importantly, next week, last class of 2018, and it's also a Brown Bag Fellowship, so I encourage you guys, put it on your calendar and come and, and enjoy that fellowship. And, then the, the, and remember, if you ask and you forget over the holidays, when are we starting up again? New Year's Eve is a Monday. New Year's Eve, we will not be here. <laughs> we'll be here the week after that. Uh, so... All right, so here we go. We've, uh, by the way, it's now official. You can say it. Merry Christmas. <laughs> All right, Merry Christmas. And you know, you think about it, we sing a Christmas carol. The Christmas Advent season has started. The Bible's about Jesus, so we're going to tie this week's lesson into Christmas. Say, well, how does that happen in 1 Samuel? Well, of course, Christmas is the celebration of the birth of Jesus. And why do we celebrate the birth of Jesus? That's because He is our Savior. How does He save us? How did, how did He, how does He, how will He do it? The way, the way He did it was through sacrificial love. Sacrificial obedience to the Father all the way to the cross. And that's specifically, that's why He came. When we're, of course, when we're celebrating Christmas, we're always thinking about He's a, he's a baby Jesus, but He came to save us. This is a rescue mission for us. And because Jesus bore his cross for us, we're called, Jesus calls us to bear our cross for him. And we may ask, well, what does that mean? What is our cross? And that is the cost. Whatever the cost of the sacrifices involved with obeying God in this life that he gives us, just like Jesus did sacrificially obedient to the Father, out of love. And we get to see that sacrificial love this week in the lives of uh, David and Jonathan and Michal. By the way, that's what I'll pronounce it. And I see Micah out there. I don't know if, if you know that's the way we pronounce it, but I'll say Michal. Uh, that they're all living sacrificially and, th and showing sacrificial love here. And we'll get to see just the opposite in Saul. And someone that's choosing to live for self and see what that looks like, we see the difference between the state of mind and the fruits for Saul in that way of thinking, and then the state of mind, state of being, and the fruits for sacrificial living and loving of David, Jonathan, and Michal. And we know that this sacrificial living is all according to God's plan and all to support God's plan. And in constant contradiction to the way that the way of man the way we think on our own the way we think and act and this concept of sacrificial living of carrying a cross it's not worldly thinking but then we didn't come here to study worldly thinking did we we came here to study godly living godly thinking and that's living by faith so let's get after it here we've got three divisions this week chapters 18 19 and 20 we'll start off with the first one which i call uh lose to win. He asked at the beginning, you know, in what do you trust? In worldly success or in God's providence, God's provision? And we're going to see both of those choices right here in this chapter 18. You start off chapter 18 opens, and here's Jonathan, and it says that he became one in spirit with God. Other versions say that their spirits were knitted together. And he made this covenant. It's just a one-way covenant. And Jonathan is pledging his life to David. And he's offering him his royal robe and tunic, his sword. And he, so he's clearly showing sacrificial love that we know is inspired by God. It wasn't because they had a lifelong relationship and he just came to you know, like David, as many of us do with friends. But this was coming from God. And, and just an interesting note here that Jonathan is about 30 years older than this young David. Now, I, I know when I first read it, I was thinking Jonathan was the younger one. So it really puts in perspective what kind of sacrificial love this was that Jonathan had for David because he's so much older. And now, check out the symbolism here. You know, the, Jonathan and David, by worldly standards, they should be rivals. You know, when Saul dies, who's going to be the next king? Well, of course, it should be According to worldly descent, it would be Jonathan as the firstborn. 
And so here David has been anointed by God to be the next king. So these guys should be recognize each other. They're rivals. Uh, but it's just the opposite. And, and then you go back and you think about for a moment, in chapter 17, you remember David, he was the only one to step up and say, I'll go fight Goliath, God's, God's with us. And Saul offered his royal armor to David. You remember David, you know, he, he, he re declined, respectfully refused it, this royal garb, and that would symbolically to be crowning him as king. And David said, no, I'm not ready for that, or I don't want that. But here he's accepting the royal garb of Jonathan, and his position is heir to the throne. So symbolically, he is receiving and accepting this, this, this cloaking as the heir to the throne. And, and then, by the way, we see also, when we go back and think for a moment, why did David refuse Saul's armor? Well, it's easy, to, we think, we see... With, in our mind, we see David. You know, he's really fast. He's jumping around and he's throwing rocks. But at the same time, that's that. You think for a moment when he when he told Saul, "Why is he not taking this armor?" And in my version, he said he's not tested it yet. And so I read further in a Hebrew. They said a reasonable interpretation actually that David said, "I have not been tested yet." So he's prophetically declaring why he's not ready. He could not assume the role of king yet because he's not been first tested and prepared by God to take that role. And you contrast that with Saul. You know, Saul, he was never tested or prepared. But he simply was given this kingship the way we in the world want things. Instantly. Right? And so anyway, you, yeah, I just want to note that difference. And, and, and uh, back into chapter 18... Jonathan has pledged his love to David, and David is successful in everything that he does for Saul. Of course, defeating Goliath, Saul is promoting him, and you see them, and they're, they're coming back to town, and the ladies are coming out, and, and they're singing, and you can see Saul with a big smile on his face. Saul has killed his thousands, and then he hears, and David is 10,000. And, and this is not good, because, you know, it, it, it causes this jealousy and anger in Saul. And, it, and you realize, too, that this now you're, now you're really comparing what we see God showing us, a sinful nature in Saul. And I, I wrote down, what does the throne loss mean for Saul? It's fear. He says, well, what's next? Is there anything left but taking my throne? So he's, he's concerned about, and here's David, and by the way, we'll see throughout the life of Saul that David is going to be loyal to Saul, always will be. He's, he's, he has saved the Israel army right, by defeating Goliath. But nonetheless, Saul has this worldly fear. We see man's nature coming at him. And you contrast that with Jonathan's sacrificial love. And I wrote down what is throne loss for Jonathan. For him, it is gain. Because he realizes that, 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 that God provides. And he's seen when God was with Saul what it was like with his dad. And now he's seeing what it's like when, when he recognizes when God's with somebody, David. And so in this providential love that Jonathan is recognizing, we see the differences in these two choices. And now we can, we, you know, we always, we're trying to see, well, how does this apply to us as well? And what is this teaching us? And I said earlier, we're going to tie it to Christmas, to Jesus. Well, you look at Jesus now. You remember John the Baptist. He came to uh, pronounce the coming of Jesus. And you remember some people were starting to praise John the Baptist. And in John, <clears throat> excuse me, 3.30, John the Baptist said of Jesus and himself, He must become greater. I must become less. You see that contrast. And then even further, Paul similarly in Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus was sacrificially giving, obedient to the Father, and you see the joy that came from it. Uh, and unlike the opposite view that Saul has. And so now we go back, and now here we are You can in uh, verse 10 where you can see they're in the palace. David is playing the harp like he normally does to take away the evil spirit, but it doesn't work. And it's, in some versions, says Saul is raving. And he throws his spirit at, at, uh, at David, and it says, and by the way, it says that he missed him twice. And you think, what do you learn from that? You know, because you think, well, surely he didn't go over and Saul's 
pulling his spear out and saying, hang on, David, and he's getting back and taking another aim at it. There was probably a little bit of time in between, but the, the point that I, I, I think to take from it is that David still stuck around the palace, loyal to Saul, still serving Saul obediently. <laughs> like Christ, who did not retaliate against his persecutors. Even to the end, you know, we know that when he was on the cross, he's asking God to forgive his enemies. And you know, so we see that in David here. Now David continues, you know, it says he's successful in everything because the Lord is with him. Uh, and while Israel is, is loved, that Israel loves David, Saul becomes more and more afraid of him. And then we get to the point here where Saul offers his eldest daughter, uh, Mirab, to David. And it, it David respectfully declined. And, and you know, one thing about this, you know, Saul, by do, what he did, he's already uh, reneged on the promise that he made when they're out there in the battlefield that whoever kills Jonathan is going to have my oldest daughter. Well, and now he puts a condition on it. He says, well, David, you can have my oldest daughter, but fight for me. And so he's, he's put a condition on it, and we know really Saul's just trying to get David out there with some Philistines somewhere, somehow, that he'll, they'll kill him. Now we move on to McCall. It says that McCall loved David, and, and, now, and David hears about this, and he would... He would this sounds good, and, it, and of course it does. There's nothing wrong with saying, well, hey, this, this beautiful lady loves me, and there's obviously she's being filled with the Spirit. David's recognizing it, and here's the problem. David points out his, his lowly status in life, if you will, and, and it's, he's not able to pay the dowry. As you think about what the dowry is going to be for a royal daughter, you know, how is he going to do that? And he's saying, how, he's, how, how can I do that? And maybe the way he's saying it, is prompting to ask Saul, well, how can he do it? And of course, Saul says, well, go get me 100 Philistine foreskins. What better for a wedding present than 200 Philistine foreskins? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah, odd wedding gift. Uh, <laughs> the point, of course, that it's another plot by Saul that God turns on its head to protect David. And when Saul realized that the Lord is, 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 is with David and that his daughter Michal loves David, it says Saul was, became still more afraid and remained his enemy the rest of the days. And you know, Saul recognizes he's, the Lord has been with him. We know this. But we also know from back in chapter th 13 we studied when Saul disobeyed God, Samuel told Saul, but now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people. And, and, I, and I didn't catch it back then. But back then Samuel said the Lord has appointed someone, past tense, because he has anointed David. And Saul recognizing David's after God, God's with David, this is him. This is who Samuel told me about. And so David's success, including the fact that the Lord was no longer with Saul, is just making Saul all the more frightened and angry. And now we go back and we compare this to, to Jesus again. Think about how Jesus, no matter how much good he did, you know, it, it literally the word teaches us, Jesus went around doing good. He was healing all kinds of sickness and, 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 and doing all this good. And he's also, no matter how much he is explaining and showing to the Pharisees, read the law, the prophecies, it is proving that I am the Messiah. But all of that good and all of that teaching by Jesus just prompted the Pharisees in a similar way just to hate and fear Jesus all the more. Remember, they're fearing Jesus is going to take their place instead of being joyous that this is our Savior. And Jesus himself said in John 15, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Well, nonetheless, we move on and we see that David he continues to have this great success in battling the Philistines. And notably, it says he has more success than Saul's officers, which incidentally seems to be just kind of an abject lesson in Romans 8.31. If God is for us, who can be against us? And it's just proven out here. But the principle throughout from this, uh, this chapter for me was that we get, as I phrase it, we get it all from Christ by giving it all to him. You know, the temporary costs, and there are costs, and Jesus says so, but those temporary costs of following Christ don't compare to the eternal rewards. 
Jesus said in Matthew 16 to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. And we get to see this, and we get to think, well, okay, I, I need to be bearing my own cross. God, Jesus is telling me I need to do this. So what part of my cross am I not carrying? And we can all sit back and examine our lives. Is, there, is, it, uh, is it someone that I need to forgive? What is that cost? Is it something uh, that I need to sacrifice? Is it do I need to serve? Is it time or it's money? Is it, and really, and, and, and I, for me, I sit back and I'm really thinking about relationships. Where, where am I not, if I'm not being bold in my testimony for Christ, am I not being loving in my testimony? Am I not being loving to my friends enough? Loving to you enough? Loving to the people that I work with enough? And whatever it is, I know Christ, if He can be on the cross asking God to forgive His enemies, He can ask more of me because He gives it all to me. Let's go to chapter 19. Providential protection. All right, so we jump in. A, we just learned, we know for sure in 18, it says that Saul is an enemy forever and has chosen to do so, be an enemy of David. So he tells everyone in the palace, all his attendants, kill David. That's the standing order throughout the kingdom. And Jonathan, of course, it says, speaks up. Dad, Dad, this man went out. And you remember we were all standing out there shaking in the field for 40 days. He defeated Goliath for you. He made our your kingdom right, thrive. So let's, Dad, let's just don't do it, you know. And, you, and, and Saul, of course, he's going to renege on it, but he takes an oath not to kill David. And we're going to ask, why is Jonathan so drawn on this loyalty to David, knowing, again, David's going to take his place as king? You know, for one thing, you can think Jonathan, he's drawn to somebody else who's got such a brave heart for God. As we go back, and you remember, I kind of skimmed over myself in my mind in chapter 14 when Jonathan grabbed his, his armor bearer by himself and said, the Lord's with us, and he went to go take off and fight the Philistines by himself, right? And he conquered whatever that group was, you remember. And, uh, and so he recognizes that was God why he could do that, why he won, and he sees it now even more big time uh, in David. And then, of course, it's, it's because God is working in Jonathan's heart. And then we ask, well, why? Why is God working in Jonathan's heart that way? Well, of course, it's to accomplish God's will. And what do we mean by that? And, and again, to tie it to Christmas, that's pretty easy. You look to Luke 2, it's a Christmas story. Shepherds are out in the field. Angel comes. They're terrified. Angel tells the, she the, sh the, uh, the shepherds, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. And here it is. Today in the town of David, a Savior is born. Then you turn to Matthew 1, the genealogy of Jesus. And you guys know this, but it's, just, it's good to remember it. Right? In the genealogy of David, it says, Jesse, the father of David. And you recall last week, right at the end after David uh, had uh, defeated Jonathan, that Saul calls him up, and for some reason he doesn't remember uh, David. I'm, I said he, David defeated Goliath, not Jonathan. Excuse me. Uh, but and Saul calls him up and says, And who is this young man? Where is he from? And you remember David answered him, I am the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. And where in Luke 2 did the angel say Jesus was born? The town of David, which is Bethlehem. So this is providence. This is God working to make happen His will. Uh, we move on in chapter 19. We see that once again, now, I remember, okay, Saul has made an oath. All right, to Jonathan, son, I won't, I, I, I stop, I won't kill David. And so David goes out and he defeats the Philistines for Israel, for Saul's kingdom. And then here it is, the evil spirit came on Saul and Saul tried to spear David again, breaking his oath. But God continues to say, you know, and he didn't, he didn't get David, right? So God continues this providential blessing on David's life. Uh, and, then we, and then we move on to the part where Saul sends these men to David's house to track him down and to kill him. And Michal, his wife, urges him to leave, lets him down out the window, and she puts this, uh, this idol in the bed, you know, and, and, you, and that's, which is another little lesson. We stop for a moment and look at Michal. 
Uh, she saved David from her crazy father. Like Jonathan, she's risking everything for David. And, the, and by the way, you look at kind of the symbolism. You know, realizing she's... And, and Saul said, grab the bed, basically, and bring... Who supposedly David's sick. Just grab the whole bed and bring him and David into the palace so I can kill him. And so Michal, symbolically, she's sacrificing her idol, right, to follow God's will here. And then, and yes... She lied, but I don't think this is a lesson that God condones lying. What, what we do see here, and we learn, is that Michal, uh, she's loyal to David because God is drawing her closer to, to him through David, clearly. And this, again, is God's providence at work in the souls of these people close to David. All right, so Jonathan and Michal have both kept their oaths to David. And now we can ask, well, where is it that God is calling you to trust Him at some risk to yourself? Because that's what they're doing, right? Now, last we see David, he has, has decided to go back to Samuel, who God had used to anoint him to start with at, at, at Ramah. And this is, frankly, it's kind of funny if you think about it, but uh, it's just, but it's so, it shows God so powerful. Because all these, these groups of men keep coming and they're prophesying with Samuel. And then finally Saul comes and he's doing the same thing. And, you, and, it, and the text doesn't say, but what are they prophesying about? Right? It must be something that they would not otherwise normally say. And my guess is, as part of it is that they're saying the Lord is with David. Because none of these soldiers would say that otherwise because they know that Saul will kill him if they say that. And probably then Saul's saying the same thing, you know, and, they, and, they, and he says he's... He's there naked and prophesizing. And the people said, is Saul also among the prophets? And probably you know, in, just, um, <laughs> in complete disbelief on what's going on. Um, after this, it just seems crazy after Saul's been trying to kill him. But amid Saul's you know, this evil pursuit, God kept David secure. And, and how does it apply to us? And the principle is that Christians can trust their future is secure in God's providence. We can trust our future is secure in God's providence. You know, where did David find refuge and strength? And I heard, I stopped in a couple of the classes you guys were talking about. It is cool how BSF is leading us to the parallel Psalms that David's writing during uh, all this time that he's being persecuted. You know, this uh, Psalm 59, the memory verse, But I will sing of your strength in the morning. I will sing of your love, for you are my fortress, my refuge in times of trouble. It's easy to, to sit back and think, well, this is David. He's been anointed. Nothing's going to happen to him. Well, David doesn't know that. When Saul picks up that big spear and chunks it at him, you know, this is, David's not just, just casually laying around, you know. These are real dangers. But he keeps turning to God and, and leaning on him. And even when the, the conspiring, and he doesn't know who to trust. And how often could that be in our fears in the world and we stop and do exactly what David said? I'm going to turn to God. And that's where we get that peace. And now you can ask yourself, are you trusting in the world or are you trusting in God? And, and if you don't know, we have gauges. You know, are you, you know, these signs, are you, does you, is, you feel like your life is marked with fear, worry, with anger, with jealousy? Or is your heart marked by peace? If it's not marked by peace, this is not a condemnation on us. This is that opportunity to do exactly what David's showing us in the Psalms, to go to God. God, please just help me to trust you because you, I know you have this in your hands. And he does. And he helps us with that peace. Isn't that comforting? All right. Now into chapter 20. This is a quick one here, but it's, it's these godly friendships. You know, uh, David and Jonathan talk, and, 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 and David has to tell Jonathan, Jonathan, listen, your dad wants to kill me. And I don't think he's, I don't think he's telling you because he just either he don't want to hurt your feelings or he's afraid you might not give me up. But they came up with this scheme at this feast, and he's going to send David to Bethlehem. And depending on Saul's reaction, they'll know. And, of course, <laughs> they know from reaction because Saul tries to kill Jonathan. Jonathan, yep, I think you're right, David. Saul wants to kill you. <laughs> And they and they go out and they and they and they and and you see this meeting out in the field and they, and they're making 
uh, renewing this covenant, and, and Jonathan's renewing his, and he's asking for David's uh, loyalty here, because now he's really, listen, John, think about it, Jonathan, Saul's king, Saul just tried to kill him, if Jonathan's going to help David, he needs to make sure if David's going to, when, when, when David becomes king, he'll be protected, it's reasonable, and David, of course, bows down to him, gives him his oath, and I'll tell you guys, we'll get to see um, in 2 Samuel chapter 9, David honors this oath all the way to the last living relative of Jonathan and brings him into the palace. And it's really neat to, that we'll get to see that. Uh, and then we'll also see in chapter 23, uh, Jonathan coming out and continuing to support David. So these guys continue to keep their oaths to each other. And the principle here that God blesses believers through mutual, their mutual fellowships, and I say friendships, and encouragement. You think about, and this is, how many times have you heard it said that a man with a few good friends is a rich man? You know, it's something that God gives us that's a real treasure. You know, where, do, where, where else do we really get to receive some of the nuggets that God gives us but from our friends? And the fellowship that we have among believers is as encouraging as you can find. You know, you're not going to get it in the world. And look how God blesses us right here in this room. And even in our groups, you think about, well, how, how, can I, how can I be a better friend to somebody? How, how can I open up? How can I support them better? How can I pray for them? How can I just hang out with them? How can I, how can I show that I accept you unconditionally? Because you're one of God's children like me. And you think about one of the great ways to enjoy fellowship, by the way, is 6 o'clock next week, Brown Bag Fellowship. <laughs> Uh, guys, we'll, we will stack the chairs. Let's pray and we'll go. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for the fact that you continue to show us through fact, through history of your word, that our future is secure in you. Jesus, we thank you so much that you came to this earth. We thank you for the opportunity to celebrate your birth at this time of year and Christmas. So we remember what you did for us on the cross the sacrificial living that you did, Lord. Please help each of us to love like you did, like you love us, and to obey like you did, Lord. To your glory, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.